Hello everyone, we're going to continue our discussion of the periodic properties of elements in part four of our discussion. And in this discussion, we're going to look at some of the properties of the groups. And as, as I've, we've talked about that those are your columns on your periodic table. So hopefully you have your periodic table out as we go through this. The properties of the elements, as we said earlier, follow this periodic pattern. And so elements in the same column have similar properties. And elements in a period show the, a pattern that repeats. So that column is what we call groups, or some people call them families. And they fall into a certain familial group. The number of valence electrons and the types of orbitals they occupy are also periodic. So if you're in 1A, then you are all going to have um, an S1 configuration, right? And you're going to have one valence electron. So the periodic table, I call it the ultimate cheat sheet for chemists uh, because we always let you have a copy of it to use. We don't always let you have the names, but we do at least uh, most of the information. So you need to know what these are called. So when someone refers to one of these families or groups that you'll know what they're talking about. Group 1A, which is on the far left of your periodic table, are called the alkali metals. All right, and the alkali metals are going to have one valence electron, which means that they are going to lose one electron and form a plus one charge. And so if you look, you can put it on your copy of your um, periodic table, um, you could write plus one above the 1A. Your alkaline earth metals is in group 2A. So it sounds almost like alkali metals, except it's alkaline earth metals. And those will form a plus two charge. And they have two valence electrons. The transition and inner transition metals, the D block and the F block, those are going to also form positively charged ions, okay? But th they're variable, we don't know. They could lose one, they could lose two um, because they don't follow all of our nice rules. And then the P block, which is on your far right, is gonna have several groups, and we're going to talk specifically about those, they're going to also lose electrons, most of them. So we said that we have metals, okay, so this, this is what we're talking about here, the metals. They form positive ions, and they're on the left-hand side pretty much of the periodic table. Then there are the nonmetals, and the nonmetals are all going to be on the right hand side, and they gain electrons and form negative charges. The metalloids are going to, you're going to see this zigzag line that separates these, the nonmetals from the metals, and then you're going to have some in this area here of the zigzag line that can exhibit both properties, some of one, some of the other, of the metals and the nonmetals. So they're kind of like a transitional group. The important groups on the right hand side of the periodic table is a group 7A, which is called the halogens. And as I said, they'll form a negative one charge. So you might want to put a negative one over your 7A group. And then your 8A group are your noble gases. And the thing about noble gases is they have eight valence electrons, which except for helium, which doesn't have that many, um, which makes them non-reactive because they have a full P shell. So since they have a full shell, they're very stable, and they do not really want to get into a reaction. We used to call them the inert gases, which means they wouldn't have any type of reaction. But now we call them noble gases because we can make them. They don't normally do it, but we can make them uh, 
participate in reactions. Your halogens are like your chlorine, bromine, iodine, those going down that group. And you're going to see those in almost every reaction that occurs. They're very, very reactive. So when I talk about them, these um, elements losing or gaining electrons, they do that because really what's happening in inorganic chemistry is this positive and negative interaction. And so we've seen that in the nucleus that's positive and your negatively charged electrons. So there's an interaction there. We also see when we're doing chemical reactions that our metals are going to lose electrons and they will become positively charged. We call that a cation. And I remember it's positive because it's got a big plus sign in the middle. And then the nonmetals form anions and they are negatively charged. So to the left of the zigzag line, they're going to be metals and form cations. To the right, they're going to be anions. And then if they're metalloids, who knows? So you're going to label your periodic table so that you can help remember that. So the way this pattern works is that we already said that this means you've got one valence, two valence, three valence, whatever that number is, that's how many valence electrons you have, right? And then when they form ions, everything in the alkali metals is going to form a plus one. The alkaline earth metals is going to form a plus two. Those in group 3A, and you don't have to know any name for that, are going to be a plus 3. And then we're going to skip 4 because you have 4 um, that you can share. And carbon is kind of the poster child for this. And it can share 4 electrons, and so it shares. And then you just go negative 3 for group 5A negative 2 for group 6a and negative 1 for group 7a and we don't ionize group 8 okay so it's important that you remember that because you can predict the charges that these ions are going to make and ions are created usually when we dump something in water and they dissociate in water and and turn into ions you're going to learn all about that later so let's predict the charges of some of these ions. And we're going to do it by looking and seeing, uh, by looking at the periodic table. Did I not put one? I thought I put one on here. OK. Um, so let's take aluminum first. So if I want to predict the charge of aluminum, I'm going to look over here. And I'm going to look and see that it is in group 3A. So what does that tell me? It tells me it has three valence electrons. And if I marked my periodic table, it's going to form a plus three. If it does that, if it forms a plus three ion, that means it loses all three of those valence electrons. The second one is sulfur. Sulfur is in group 6A. Okay, that tells me it has six valence electrons. And if you wrote down the charge that I said sulfur was going to have, it's a minus two. Now, for now, we're just writing this down, and you're believing me because you think I know what I'm talking about. Okay, but the reason is, it, well, I'm not going to go into it yet. When we start naming and drawing them, I'm going to tell you all about this. So, for now, please just trust me. Don't go off on a Khan Academy campaign or anything. Just trust me with this, that these are the charges that these guys make. And for now, you just need to know that. And then later, we're going to find out why. Okay? So here's a practice for you to do. And that is it for predicting charges of ions.